Richard, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Casey, I've been really looking forward to this for a long time. So uh, here we are, and thank you for having me. Well, anytime I have someone referred to me by a previous podcast guest that I have nothing but respect for, Aviva <laughs> Wittenberg Cox, in this scenario, I'm really excited to have the conversation. She had sent yeah. me over uh, your name. Then I dug in, started doing a little research, and I got, how did I miss Richard? I mean, just a prolific purpose guy. I mean, not just prolific, but you have been uh, looking at your LinkedIn. You've been in the same role for 42 years and three months. I don't see any other jobs <laughs> on your resume outside of InVenture, the purpose company. And you're a nationally certified master career counselor, a national certified counselor, a master's degree in counseling. <laughs> I'm going, well, he's a master career counselor. He seems to be pretty good at it because he's only ever had one job. <laughs> well, my colleagues call me the Pope of Purpose. So um, <laughs> I like the key, that. The, the key is that I have been uh, in the midst of or doing a deep dive into the purpose conversation and the purpose uh, movement for decades. And so um, I want to share with you some of the insights from that. Yeah. And I wanted to kick off our conversation and kind of the area of your TED talk, but just different areas that I find really interesting in your bio and in your experience have to do with your experience in Tanzania uh, over the years. You've led something called InVenture Expeditions in Tanz Tanzania over the years. And I just wanted to kind of start there. You know, what? why Tanzania? What got you started there? How often have you been doing this? How long have you been doing this? What's the purpose of these events? Well, if you look at my company, InVenture, as opposed to adventure, that gives you a clue. InVenture expeditions are travels both outwardly and inwardly. And in 1983, I was on the board of uh, trustees of Outward Bound. And uh, I went with that board to Tanzania, never having been there before, but had a long time interest in the snows of Kilimanjaro and books like that. And uh, Went there and climbed Kilimanjaro to raise money for Outward Bound and to do a safari and to visit the African Outward Bound School. And Casey, I don't know where your sense of place is, but all of a sudden, when I hit the tarmac and I got off the plane in Tanzania, something clicked. And I can't explain it, but something clicked like I'm home. And I climbed Kilimanjaro, which I've now done eight times. Uh, which is seven more than any civilized person should do, but um, and uh, fell in love with Tanzania and started to lead my own trips after that uh, called InVenture Expeditions, and eventually found, uh, co-founded a uh, uh, NGO over there called Dorobo Safaris. Dorobo is a na uh, overarching name for hunter-gatherer types of tribes. So I've been involved there now for all these years going back, except for COVID now, it's, it's been, God, it's been three or four years since I've been back, which I really miss it. But I'm, in, I'm connected with them all the time over there through Zoom and everything. But it's not the same, obviously. But I've been leading InVenture Expeditions for um, since 1985, every year except for. And the subtitle is Back to the Rhythm. People say, well, what's this Back to the Rhythm? And I said, you know what it is intuitively. It's back to your core, back to what really matters. It's back to uh, what your company is all about, about meaning and purpose in life. And what can we learn there from people who have been living a lifestyle of, I'll call purpose and meaning. Uh, and I've learned so much from elders and other leaders in Africa over the decades and have written about it uh, over the, that time. But back to the rhythm is really what we're doing today right here now it's back to your core back to the core of what really matters in your life you know i just finished reading boyd vardy's uh, the lion tracker's guide to life i don't know if you're familiar with that one um, yeah. but it's a great book uh, that is really centered in africa about life and meaning yeah. and purpose right. and uh -huh. I just adored the book and yeah. it seems that there's something special about africa what do you think is so special about Africa that brings about this sense of purpose and meaning? Well, I think we yearn for 
the wild in certain ways. So there's that. There's that. But let me share with you. Um, uh, one of the books I wrote is called Claiming Your Place at the Fire. And that book came about because of a conversation I had with an elder in Africa from a tribe called the Hadza, which is hunter Hadza is a hunter-gatherer tribe. They've been around, Casey, for about 100,000 years. And um, when uh, so here I'm with this elder, and I'm interviewing him for my book, Claiming Your Place at the Fire, because I noticed that the wisest of the elders sit the closest to the fire. Now, I have a fire in the background here, so that's not the point. But, uh, the, uh, you know, where would my place be as, uh, as I grow older? Where would your place be? Would it be close to the fire or far from the fire, depending on not your age, but your wisdom? So this mm. uh, man who is a elder in the Hadza tribe was getting a little tired of my interview, and he said, do you mind if can we step aside from the fire and through a translator I could talk to him in Swahili, but he was talking in an ancient click language, a Khoisan click type language. And uh, so through a translator, he said, Richard, do you know what the two most important days in your life are? And I said, sure, birth and death. And he looked down at his feet and he said, well, you wrote these books and you came out here and you flew. No. Well, I said, what are the two most important days in the life of Ahadza? And he said, number one is birth because of... Um, infant mortality and things like that. And he said the second most important day in your life is the day that you determine why you were born, what you're here to do. And I said, oh my, I said, his name is Kampala, and he's never been more than 50 kilometers from where we're standing at that moment. And I've studied it all over the world for four decades. And uh, I said, how do people determine why they're here? And he said, as elders, that's what we help them do. We help them name their purpose, and there's in, in this case, it's not. It's it's really naming their gifts, what what they bring to the tribe. So I think Africa represents not only the wild, but it also represents wisdom, and uh, in certain ways, and the unknown and the mystery mystery that we all live with in our lives, and so. Um, I keep going back, and I love the people in Africa. People say, oh, the animals and climbing Kilimanjaro. And I said, it's not about that. It's the people. And so uh, that's, the, that's my point. Hmm. I, I didn't know this about the fire and that those that had greater wisdom or that were recognized to have greater wisdom in the tribe, they sat closer to the fire, and it didn't have anything to do with with age, how do they right. discern that? How do they discern who gets the, the right to sit closest to the fire? Who's, who, who carries the most wisdom? Those that hold the stories, the myths, the, um, you know, the history in certain ways. And, you know, they're not in, keep in mind, that without internet, without encyclopedias, without all these things, how do things over history, how do they get transcribed? Well, they get from one generation to the next, from elders to youngers. And so that's um, why claiming your place at the fire was um, an important insight for me. Yeah. Well, another important insight, one of the ones that I really <clears throat> enjoyed, and I think this is the origin story of uh, one of your books that sold over a million copies, Repacking Your Bags, Lighten the Load for the Good Life. You talk about a trek you were on with an elder where you had to ditch yeah. some things. And I don't want to, I don't want to you know, spoil the story. So please you know, share that story for those that haven't heard it. The trips used to be uh, backpacking trips. And now they're more like walking or hiking and, you know, with the day pack and things like that. But in the past, picture yourself walking with a, with a pack. Like we were in this uh, story. And uh, on the left is the Serengeti. You know, there's millions of animals, and we usually go in January, February, when the wildebeest are calving, so there's all kinds of action. On the right of where we're walking in the green hills of, of Africa it are the snows of Kilimanjaro and other mountains like Ladonia Langai and others. So it's spectacular, and we're hiking there, or backpacking, as I said, at the uh, grace of a tribe called the Maasai. And I'm walking next to a Maasai elder named Koye, and uh, I'm leading, he's leading, but I'm co-leading the trip, and there are a dozen of us, and 
he keeps looking over his shoulder at my pack and he keeps looking at me and we're talking back and forth and and he sees that I'm not actually observing everything on the left and the right because I'm looking down kind of what they call slogging in the trade. When you're tired carrying a pack, you're slogging one foot in front of the other. We get to where we're going to be at the end of the day, and uh, this is our first day out, and this is his first day with people like us. And um, he says, uh, and I put my pack down in the dust, and we're going to camp there for the night at one of the villages where he's an elder. And he says, Richard, what are you guys carrying? What, what's in these things? Why, are you, why did you bring all this? All I have is a herding stick and a spear, and you've got, you know, like a lot. And so I, I, I start to unpack my bag, and out comes the wilderness first aid kit, out comes the root finders, out comes the uh, water filters, out comes my Gore-Tex rain gear. I'm piling all this out, and I'm looking at it myself going, you know, what, what am I doing here? And, and he comes over to me, and he says, Richard, tell me this question. Does all this make you happy? And I paused, and I immediately went into, well, I need this, I need this, I need this. And I realized that I was carrying twice as much as I needed, that I was weighed down, that I was overpacked, and which could happen to any of us. And uh, that day, then I went, or that night, I uh, went to the fire and I told the group that I just had this, this incident with uh, this event with Koye, and I'm going to leave half of my stuff here. And they said, well, you told us what to bring. What half are you stay keeping and what half are you leaving? And so we went through that whole conversation. But then, Casey, the conversation morphed into, well, this is a metaphor for my life. I came over here back to the rhythm and InVenture expedition to figure out what to do with the next phase of my life. And I need, uh, obviously, to unpack some things and to repack some things. So that night I went to my tent and I wrote down, repack your bags lighten your load and that became an international bestseller which has been out there for several decades now sold millions of copies in 20 some languages so the question is to your audience what makes you happy what is the good life and then we def we determine my co-author david shapiro who's a philosophy professor in seattle well uh, we determined went way back to Aristotle, to Plato, to others to say, well, what is the good life? And what was it? And what is it over history? And what is it today? And we saw that the good life had four characteristics. Place, people, right work, and purpose, in addition to health and money. Health and money, which is very clear to your business and my business, but beyond that, or in addition to that, are you living in the place you love, with the people you love, doing the work you love, whether it's creative work and retirement work or paid work, with purpose? And we saw that those four characteristics scientifically were fundamental, and as is purpose, fundamental. And so um, that's how that whole story, thank you for asking, uh, in a long, long and it's traveled around the world. That story has traveled around the world. Does all this make you happy? Well, what's in your bag? What do you need to unpack to lighten your load for the next phase of your life? And I think for a lot of people who are retiring, for example, they're going through the unpacking, repacking process, and they don't know how to do it. And you can help them, and you are helping them. And that's, your, that's what your business is all about, ultimately, in addition to, uh, obviously, the financial um, resources to do that. You know, as I thought about you and I imagined my taking all these things out of my backpack, you know, first aid kit, uh, you know, gorgeous, yeah. you know, all these things yeah. that right. seem pretty necessary, right? And, and in the moment you're asked, does all this make you happy? Well, it's making you miserable in the moment, right? Because you're carrying all this junk and it's weighing you down. It's making you tired. You can't really enjoy the scenery as a result of it, but you didn't need it at the time, right? It's making you unhappy right. in that moment. But if you needed it, it would make you really happy. So did right. you find we, that? We, yeah, we, that's a, I know we're exactly where you're going, and I agree with you. What we looked at is what's essential to the good life, not what's, you know, 
all the luxuries. But And so when you look at what's essential, there are essentials like health, like the first aid kit and hydration and things like that and safety. So we didn't, we didn't give those things up for sure. And so I think if you look at retirement, for example, what's essential to the good life in the next phase of, of life? And how do you determine what are the essentials beyond health and money, which are fundamental? What we know is this, is that purpose is absolutely fundamental, not a luxury, to health, to healing, to happiness, and ultimately to longevity. But most people aren't getting that information early in life. That's why what you're doing is so important, to help people to say, I need health and I need my financial resources, but I also need a reason to get up in the morning. If I don't have, I call it the three M's, and money, medicine, and meaning. Do you have enough money? Check. Do you have enough health? Medicine is key for it. But do you have meaning? If you have enough money, we, you know people, and you've got clients probably who have enough money and enough health that are miserable, or if not miserable, hungering for meaning. And um, so that third M of meaning is just, we're finding it's just as fundamental oftentimes as health and money. Mm-hmm. That's a big insight for people to, to swallow these days, but the science is now there. And, you know, every new idea goes through three steps, ridicule, opposition, self-evident. We now know that meaning is self-evident, not a luxury. I can yeah. point to science after science after science. And the book you pointed, Man's uh, not man, uh, the power of pur- Guide to Life. <laughs> no. Or, or <laughs> the purpose, Power of Purpose, yeah. No, The Power of Purpose. The last chapter is, can science explain purpose? And the answer is absolutely yes. Well, but that isn't getting out enough except through podcasts and things like this. And that's why I wanted to do this with you. All right. I've, I've got to move on from this topic, but I still want to know, did you miss anything you left behind? <laughs> did you make any mistakes there? No, <laughs> not, not really. One. Not a one. But did you have no. some anxiety? Was there some anxiety in leaving sure. certain items behind? Well, you know, what it got down to was two of everything. I mean, do I really need two of this mm. and two of that? And, um, you know, the, the, I'm very good with wilderness first aid. We needed that. We needed the hydration stuff. We needed the root finders. We needed um, other, you know, gear for warmth. It's, you know, we didn't leave any essentials. But the key is what is essential to, to not only the good life, but your life in that moment. And we yeah. do, we, we obviously didn't leave but we had the conversation about it and uh, i'll i'll say that this that on my trips you could only bring 30 pounds now think of 30 pounds sounds like a lot boots camera gear you know things like that what do you what is not essential well what is essential are is is what we talked about and Mm. i think it, it it plays out in our lives as we yeah. age for sure. Yeah. Well, we, it's this collection of things, right? And, and we see it from a financial perspective. You know, you show up and you have 35 different accounts. Yeah. How many do you actually need? Right. right. We, don't, we don't need all this stuff. And yeah. we see it in the same way that we, we have our to-do list is a simple way to look at it. Right. And I right. tell my right. team all the time, we show up every Monday and say, Hey, what are the three things that you need to do this week? Just three things that if everything else fails and you get those three things done, it was a successful week. And that's been a right. major shift for a lot of people you know, as they make these transitions to really just refine what happiness is. Because we think we need to get all these things done, right, to make right. us happy. But that's kind of the, the unpacking of what's actually making us happy or, or ultimately leading to success financially or otherwise, right? Yeah, yeah. One of the things, uh, I did a PBS special called The Power of Purpose is short, shown in about 400 cities across the U.S. And one of the exercises I did is the drawer test. I said, take a drawer in your house and open it up like a junk drawer and look at the next phase of your life and ask yourself, In the uh, have three buckets or three boxes in front of you, ask yourself, take every single thing out of that junk drawer. You could pick a closet or something like that if you wanted to. 
and ask yourself, is this essential to my happiness and fulfillment in the next, or my health if the, in the next phase of life? If it is, put it in the yes box. If it's not, put it in the no box. If you can't decide, put it in the I can't decide box. And I had people to this day who come back to me, Casey, and say, you know, I started with a drawer, then I went to a closet, and pretty soon I sold my house because I realized that, that what's essential for the next phase of my life is tangible to begin with, with stuff. But then it gets to my calendar and how I'm spending my time and my relationships. What do I need to do to unpack my relationships or unpack my calendar? And so I think that, you know, the first half of life often is about accumulation and the second half of life is about unpacking it. Decumulation, yeah, as we, we yeah. often talk about in finance. Yeah, I, right, I have, right. You, know, you look at these things, money, health, you know, really money, health, and purpose, right? Or money, medicine, meaning. Yeah. And looking at those three things, uh, it, it, I mean, I know the answer, right? Which one's the hardest to get? Right? And, and quite often we get distracted by one of the other two before we actually get to meaning, right? Right. Is that the yeah. hardest one? Well, I think we know, but I think we do get distracted and um, because it's, it's tangible. And, um, yeah, uh, you've got two I, tangible things and one intangible. Right. And so I, th I think that's true, but you know the research is pretty solid about what's important in in at the end of life, and it gets down to relationships, and it gets down to our legacy, whatever that might, however we might discern that, which we could we could talk about. And I think people know that, but uh, you know I I'm often asked to officiate at memorial services, and. Uh, Often, you know, it's it's like David Brooks writes between the the difference between legacy virtues and and uh, resume virtues. And when you do, if you look at a memorial service or you look at an obituary, it starts out with resume virtues. Here's who Casey was. Here's what he did. Here's what. But then it ultimately gets down to who he was and how he impacted my life. And that's where the real juice is. The real energy is. And so oftentimes it takes a crisis or something to wake us up to pay it more attention to that. That's great. Yeah, I, I look at the, you mentioned purpose, you mentioned meaning, um, and you, know, you also talk a lot about calling. I think it would be nice to hear you discern between those three, purpose, meaning, and calling. Yeah. Well, first of all, purpose I talk about with a big P and purpose with a little P. Purpose with a big P is kind of the noble purpose, the thing that would be your company's purpose or your life's purpose. And, and people really um, avoid, not avoid that, but um, don't discuss that because it seems too noble. I'm not Mother Teresa. I'm not Gandhi. You know, I'm not, I'm not up to, to that. And purpose of the little P, though, is what you do every day to make a difference in the lives of others. So for me personally, my big P purpose is to help your listeners unlock the power of purpose. My little P purpose is to make a small difference in one person's life today, here in Minneapolis where I am, whether that's virtual or live. And there are 1,440 purpose moments in the day, times that you can say, give someone a kind word, a hug, a, uh, an affirmation of something. And when you start to look for the little P purpose moments, life changes. We start to live purposefully rather than having a purpose. It's being purposeful or living purposefully. And so that's uh, what I, and so moving to calling. So does that make sense so far? Yeah, it, well, and you also said live on purpose. Uh, is there a nuance there? Would it, it is on purpose or with purpose? Uh, you know, purpose is always beyond. The one universal about purpose is it's always beyond yourself. It's always the difference you make in the world, in the lives of others. So that's unchangeable. Over Your yeah. purpose can change over time. Things can happen. But it's not about self-absorption. It's not about goals. It's about how you show up in the lives of the world and, and, and others. And um, so when you get to calling, 
calling is a vocational um, word for purpose. And so the, the formula that I espouse and have studied for now for decades has three characteristics. G plus P plus V equals C. Gifts plus passions plus values equals calling. And calling is your vocational discernment and effort uh, that are you using your gifts, your most enjoyed gifts on things you feel passionate, purposeful, or curious about in environments that are healthy and a good fit for you? If so, you're following your calling, which is living and working purposefully. So the, they're interchangeable uh, to me in, in many ways, but the formula is the formula. And uh, I've studied this, I've done research on it uh, around the world, and it is the universal purpose formula. Mm. So that capital P, purpose, our broad impact, little p, what we're going to do in this moment to leverage our gifts to make a positive impact on somebody else's life. And That's calling right. what we're going to do over time to continue to make a bigger and bigger impact leveraging our purpose. Would that be fair to say? That's fair to say. And I would, I would uh, round it out in two ways that I think are important for your listeners. Number one is that people say, oh, I still don't know my purpose. It's too big. You know, I will listen to Casey's podcast. And I said, all right, here's your purpose. It's the universal purpose. Jot this down. It's to grow and give. Full stop. So when I, people say, well, what does that mean? I said, well, every single day is an opportunity to grow and give. So what I'd like you to do is to write that, those two words, grow and give, on a post-it and put it on your mirror. And tomorrow morning when you get, uh, get up, look at the mirror as you're brushing your teeth and getting ready for the day. How am I going to grow and give today? And at the end of the day, before you go to bed, ask yourself, how did I grow? and give today. If you're not growing, and growing is really another word for being curious, that people who are purposeful are curious about themselves, curious about you, probably why they're on this podcast right now. And, uh, and so growing means that we're continually alive to beyond our own story to what's going on around us in the world. And then giving is that 1,440 purpose moments, did you do something today for somebody? And you'll find that with grow and give, there's a felt sense to purpose. Now, what that means, Casey, is that it's not just a concept. It's a felt sense. Wow, I, that felt good. I felt more alive. I felt more joy. I felt more meaning because I reached out in that moment rather than just have it be about about me in certain ways so the second point i wanted to make that i think is really important here is that everyone on this has fortuitous encounters has had encounters with people that have changed their lives one that changed my life forever in 1968 after i got out of graduate school i spent a week with victor frankel mm. who wrote the book man's search for meaning who is in concentration camps his whole family was exterminated. He's a psychiatrist and a neurologist in Vienna who was taken by the Nazis with his pregnant wife, Tilly, and his parents and his siblings, and they were all killed, and he survived. And he got out of the concentration camp and came back to Vienna to heal. And after he healed, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which is an epic book, mm -hmm. in, in nine days. But while he, what he said about this, he said, the last of the human freedoms is choice. It's to choose what you want your life to be about, regardless of the circumstances. And that's what purpose is. Purpose is a choice. Purpose is a verb. It's an action. And so what's the action in the concentration camp for him? He said, I could wake up in the morning and give somebody else a hug, a kind word, a will to live. And and it doesn't mean that they would automatically survive, but the chances, chances were that they might 
uh, have a better chance of survival with a will to live, with the help of others, etc. And so I learned so much from him in one week. It changed my life forever to say that purpose is about choice. Purpose is a verb. Purpose is what we do on a day-to-day basis with the, regardless of our adversity, my point is here, regardless of our age or our, our adversity, purpose is age agnostic. Young people today are having as much interest. I'm finding millennials have more purpose driven mm-hmm. conversations than older people often. Right. So that's a whole nother thing, you know, because I think we've got a broad range of ages here on this conversation. It's not just about getting older and, and having a purpose. It's throughout life. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's beautiful. And what an amazing opportunity to spend time uh, actually with Victor. Uh, that is that yeah. had to be absolutely incredible. We're going to have links to all these resources and, and books, et cetera. <laughs> In yep. the show notes. Uh, however, I want to also say we're going to put a link to the napkin test as a free exercise in the show notes. And when you do that exercise, you actually do some coaching around the exercise. So it's not just simply doing the exercise, but what, what right. kind of coaching do you do as a follow-up uh, for someone that's just went through the napkin test? Well, the napkin test is, why is it a napkin test? Well, a lot of creative ideas were held around a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or while while writing on a napkin. And uh, it just came to us and we jotted it down. So, But um, the napkin test came to me when I was on a flight uh, to give a talk in London. And my PBS special had just aired and there was a man sitting next to me who had seen it who kept bugging me about, can you help me with my life? I just lost my job and going back to clean out my apartment. And uh, we were on a flight to London and I said, look, I got to give a talk when I get there. I got to get some sleep. Take out this napkin and write down this formula. G plus P plus V equals C. And I explained it to him, which I will do. And uh, he said, this is brilliant. How come I never got any guidance like this when I was younger or even now in midlife? And I said, well, you're getting it now. So the G is gifts. That's the biggie. Uh, Well, all three are big, G and P and V. But think about your most enjoyed gifts, Casey. What do you really love to do? So here are four characteristics. I created a tool called Calling Cards, which you can get on Amazon but, uh, or on my website, but, uh, which is richardleiter.com or probably on your website. But it's, it helps you discern your most loved gifts, what you love to do. And many, many people who have got a lot of education still don't trust their gifts. So here are four characteristics of a gift. Um, Number one is something you love to do. Your hand turns to it naturally. Number two, others observe you loving to do it and doing it effortlessly and superbly. Why do the others observe it maybe more readily than you? Because they don't have that gift. So they tend to give it more value. And third, this is the big one, Casey, you can't recall learning it. Well, you know, I don't have a degree in that. I don't have a gold medal in that. I'm not the best in the world at that. I said, yeah, but look at how much you love to do it. And look at how well you do it. And you've done it for so long. And when I developed calling cards, I went back and interviewed parents, teachers, siblings. And I would ask, I'll ask you, Casey, do you have siblings? I don't. I'm the only one. That's okay. why we had three. Right. <laughs> so when I ask people if they had siblings, I'll say, are your siblings, do they have the same gifts as you? And there's laughter. They'll say, oh, no, you know, they're all different than me. Well, I see that in our own kids. Yeah. So you can see that in your own kids then. And uh, I said, when did you start to notice? Well, right away. I mean, they were all different. And they said, well, raised in the same family. Why did they end up the same? Well, because they're different. I said, that's the point. Gifts different. So we need to discern and re, uh, 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 revisit our gifts. And the fourth thing is we love learning more about it. We love studying it, developing it, hanging around with other people. And when I help people at any age, but let's say it's midlife or beyond, revisit their gifts, oftentimes they start to cry. He said, oh, I just, I wish I could have done this earlier in life, but my parents said, you know, you can't be an artist, you can't make a living, you need to go to law school. So 
they paid for me to go to law school and here I am in midlife and I don't like law. I want to go back to art or I want to bring that into my life if I continue with uh, And so gifts is a big deal to really uh, discern. And uh, you remember the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? Mm -mm. So so 10 10 million copies, the most any book on careers ever sold. Mm -hmm. Richard Bowles, who was an Episcopal priest who wrote that book, What Color Is Your Parachute? which is still out there now. He died about six, seven years ago, but uh, the book's still out there. He wrote the foreword for one of my books. And the foreword is called The Gifts We Love. And he's, uh, being an Episcopal priest, he said this, Rich, he said, Richard, I had this dream that I had a conversation with God. And I wanted to go to earth and be born. And I had a conversation with God. And God said, what do you want to do? And he said, I don't know. I don't know what to do. So God gave him certain gifts and granted him the wish to be born and to come to earth. And he woke up from his dream. And he couldn't remember the gifts. And here he is. And he said, all of us are born with gifts. And we have to discern or figure out through trial and error what those gifts are. But when we do, magic happens. There's energy. We're filled with energy rather than drained in, in, in certain ways. And so gifts is an important thing for, for us to help. You need to help your kids discern those gifts you need to do it yourself and to redo it at certain times like in retirement and then passions the p is gifts in the service of what what do you want to use your gifts to do who do you want to help what do you want to serve what do you want to solve those those uh, kinds of things what are you really curious about i was backstage um not so long ago with the founder of ted his name is Richard Saul Warman. You know, TED Talks. Mm-hmm. Richard Saul Warman sold TED. He founded it in the 80s, but he sold it to Chris Anderson, who owns it now. So I'm backstage with Richard Saul Warman, who's 87 years old. And he says to me, what are you talk- talking about, Richard? And I said, purpose. And he kind of scoffed. And he said, I said, well, Richard, what are you talking about? And he said, curiosity. He said, I founded TED based on curiosity technology, entertainment, design, how they all come together. He said, don't you think that, that curiosity is what keeps us alive? Look at the billions of people watching TED Talks. Why? Because they're curious and they want to be curious about their life and about others. So the question is, what are your gifts? What are you curious about? What are you passionate about? What do you want to use your gifts in the service of? And so the napkin test helps us to write down our gifts, write down our passions, and then values is the V, the third thing, values. And values is where we do what we do. You know, there's this thing going on right now called the great resignation with the post-pandemic, with all these people Mm -hmm. resigning. It's really about the fact that where they're doing what they're doing is not suiting and fulfilling them. They're not Mm -hmm. getting their voice in the world in certain ways. So the V could be voice or values. But it's the place where you bring who you are to life. It could be a job. It could be a volunteer situation. It could be a community situation. So gifts plus passions plus values equals calling equals a solution. So that's the napkin test. And I'd like to come back with you, Casey, because I love what you're doing, and uh, see if there's some people who might want to come back for a second round do the napkin test themselves, come back, and then you and I could coach them. What do you think? I think that's just a tremendous offer. You didn't mention that before we got started. And I thought, oh my gosh, Richard is just such a wonderful guy. He's giving already, right? So yeah. <laughs> I would love to do that. And if anyone wants to take advantage of this opportunity, you can go back to the show notes. You can go through the napkin test exercise and then email us info at howardbailey.com. Just email us at info at howardbailey.com. And then uh, we will have one of you selected to join us for a podcast where Richard will walk us through your napkin test and offer some 
coaching around this. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity to have someone like Richard of this caliber uh, do this for you. So thank you so much. Hey, for Casey and I will do our own napkin test and we'll share our results with you just to make <laughs> sure we go. you have, know that we're serious and we have integrity around this. So yeah, uh, I think that would be so much fun. I really look forward to that. Um, so, so Richard, you know, in your bio, it says that you pioneered the question, why do you get up in the morning? When I first saw that, I thought, kind of seems like a hard thing to pioneer. Is this really a new thing, purpose? Why do I get up in the morning? Isn't this something we've been asking forever? And then during your TED Talk, you mentioned a statistic that only one in three people today have a clear reason to get up in the morning. So I guess it's clear that we haven't had this figured out, but is this really a new thing? If we're pioneering it, that means that we're one of the first people to actually go through this and explore this concept. Is it really that new? No, it's not. But what's new is the practice of it. It's the distinction is that what are you really doing and how do we help people to do it? And so purpose is a path and a practice. The path is the choice to live purposely or with intention, as you call it. And the practices. So what's your practice? We're only as good as our practices. So the why do you get up in the morning question is really, so what do you, what is your practice ultimately? And so uh, I call it, well, no, let me give an example of a practice, Casey. Uh, I call it the two minute purpose practice. I love this. You, you get up in the morning and there are three steps and it takes two minutes. Step one is pause. Don't reach for your cell phone or your computer or uh, whatever you need to do to get comfortable. Pause. Secondly, three deep breaths. The body never lies. So take three deep breaths to sort of center yourself, to ground yourself. Third step is what's your intention to make a difference in someone else's life today? Picture your upcoming day and picture one person or one situation where you can make a difference in someone's life today. And make that intention out loud. Say out loud, I intend to make a difference in Casey's podcast today by doing this or sharing this, this type of thing. If you do that every day for a week, you will understand exactly why it's important to have an answer to the why question. Why do you get up, why do you get up in the morning? And uh, I love the, the uh, example of this from the American essayist. His name is E.B. White. He said this, I arise in the morning, torn between a desire to save the world and a desire to savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. Mm -hmm. I arise in the morning, torn between a desire to save the world, not literally save, but, and savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. Well, a good day is a day of both saving and savorings. If it's all about savoring, we call those people narcissists. If it's all about saving, we call those people saints. But we're not saving the world, and we're not exclusively saving. There's a balance between making a contribution to community and to family and to who, however you uh, put that together and uh, savoring. And so um, I think the, the why question is a biggie, particularly – because we're in a new phase of life as we've, uh, you know, in 1900, the average life expectancy was, what, age 47. Now the average life expectancy, you know, you can play around statistics, or, is in the, in the high 80s. I mean, we've had three decades to life. And you don't probably remember this, but I do, a book called Passages. Mm. Passages came out in 1974. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for a decade. It still is out there. And it, was, it took people with a new language and a whole new um, metaphor up to midlife called Passages. And uh, it was a bestseller and changed the game for so many people. Now we've added 30 years to life, maybe, maybe more maybe less, but, and so there's this whole new phase of life that needs a new language and new practices, and that's what I'm all about is, is these days with this new book that I've written, who do you co-authored, 
who do you want to be when you grow old? It's about this new phase of life and how do we reframe it, relanguage it, and bring new practices to it. In in that regard, uh, what impact did your dad's life have on the way that you think about retirement and, and also in writing this book? My dad's life was the old model, three stages of life. Uh, learning, earning, retiring. Now, I have to weigh in here, and I don't think you're going to like this, but the financial services industry still lives by that model. Learn, earn, retire. That's not what's happening for the preponderant majority of people, thousands of people that I interview and talk with and I'm with these days. Learn, earn, reframe, maybe retire, but if it's a new, if it's retirement, it's a new retirement. It's not the leisure retirement of the past when people live less years and live differently in terms of health, et cetera. So this new phase of life is the one that so many books that so many people are, uh, I'll say, not struggling with, but, but questioning. I find that so many financial advisors, for example, are unwilling to change their their mindset, myself included. My financial advisor, uh, who died a few years ago, continually said, well, when you retire, and I said, Larry, I'm not going to retire. I, I need the money for this and this, but not that. And and uh, so his, mo- his mental model was he wasn't listening to the new phase of life. And mm-hmm. I think what's happening now is that the whole industry is shifting like you are to help people. I mean, I look at your, you know, mission to elevate meaning and purpose in the lives of others. I mean, that's what it's all about. Now, how you define that, everybody's an experiment of one, as you know. They need to define that in their own terms, but you can help them do that rather than put in your solution, help them to figure out their solution. And I hope what we're doing here is helping with that. Yeah. Yeah. Learn, earn, retire. That, that's been a reframing for us in our business. And that's why you know, I, I titled the book Job Optional. You know, we kind of see it as learn, earn, reframe, then job optional. Right? That, that's no, kind of I, the way that, that we look at it. Uh, job Optional is a, is a great book and a great uh, concept because that's, that's part of it. Mm-hmm. It's also relationships. It's also the good life, living in the place. Where's the place for you now? people who are the people that you want to be with and then right work the third element of the good life that we've defined and that you know uh i want to send you if you don't have it the good life inventory which helps people may uh, actually to, uh, figure this out for themselves and have that conversation with you and you with them and um, so uh the job options is all about that third element the right work and then purpose. It's right work for the sake of what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we do have a, a link to that. So we will also include that in the show notes. Uh, yeah. And we're going to be giving away your book as well, your latest book, which uh, I mean, the power of purpose is phenomenal. But you're telling me that <laughs> the newest one is multiple well, better of that. So, you, OK, well, if, well, if, I the new one's my 11th book, so I'm not saying it's but I'm just um we're always in love in. with the youngest child, right? right. <laughs> well, we'd yeah. love to give that away on your behalf here today, yeah. Richard. We've got a box of copies in our office. We're going to give them away until they're all gone. Uh, so if you'd like to get a free copy of Who Do You Want to Be When You Grow Old? The Path of Purposeful Aging. All you have to do is this. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. Write an yeah. honest rating and review the podcast. And then shoot us an email at info at howardbailey.com with your iTunes username, your address. We'll send you the book for free. And again, if you want to take advantage of a one-on-one free coaching session with Richard, which we'll do with you on the podcast, please email us, info at howardbailey.com. Let us know, and we'll reach out to you and see if we can't coordinate that. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure, and I cannot wait to do it again. I enjoyed this immensely. Thank you for having me, Casey. Thanks, Richard.